Welcome, 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 everybody. I hope you can all hear me. I hope everybody's healthy and safe today, wherever you may be. Um, we look forward to sharing the next hour or so with you. Um, we're going to keep the next hour uh, interesting and fun, the, normally, the way we normally do things in our program, uh, which is to say not too scripted and uh, interactive and convivial. So my name is James Langston. I'm the coordinator of the uh, International Forestry Program, the Master of International Forestry at, uh, at UBC. Uh, I'm going to launch today's webinar, which highlights our program and what we're about, and, uh, and we'll get to hear from you for the second half of the uh, hour for some enriching discussions. Uh, all right, we can begin the session and move on. So first things first, we'd like to uh, begin by acknowledging that the land in which UBC uh, Point Gray Vancouver campus is uh, situated is uh, is on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the uh, Musqueam people, uh, and that's a picture of the totem outside the uh, Forestry Science Center at UBC. Something I hope you all get to experience one day. Um, all right, we can move forward. So our presenters today, you've, you're hearing from me right now. That's me, James Langston, and. The, uh, on the right there, um, the director of the program, Professor Intu Bodhi Hartono, uh, Jeff Sayer, and Julie Mori will be uh, contributing to the discussions. Uh, but do note that several of our illustrious professors are also joining us and will intervene to enrich our conversations today at uh, whenever they aspire to intervene. Um, all right, let's move on to the agenda. So, I'm going to move a little bit quickly for the first half of this presentation so we can leave room for your questions. First, we're going to give an overview of Vancouver, where we are, uh, the Canadian context and where University of British Columbia sits, uh, then move on to the precise bits about the program that you're interested in. Uh, then consider the sort of career opportunities that you get out of uh, enrolling in a program like ours. Uh, hear what some of the alumni have to say about the program and then get into the nitty gritty of how to apply the tuition details and the funding opportunities that there are for you. And then, and then the bulk of the time will remain for your questions and answers. So let's start with uh, getting into uh, downtown Vancouver. This is a nice picture. Um, for those of you that don't know Vancouver, it's uh, internationally known, I guess, as the sixth most livable city on the planet. That's the, uh, as designated by the Econ Economist Intelligence Unit. Uh, and one major reason for its livability index rating would be uh, its proximity. It's close to and surrounded by stunning and fun and adventurous uh, mountainous forest landscapes and marine seascapes. So that's a picture of downtown Vancouver as defined by the False Creek Inlet that's walkable, uh, very um, livable city. Um, so the, the sort of seascapes and forest mountainous landscapes are just a stunning uh, aspect and trait of, of, of Vancouver. So about two and a half million people live in the metro area. Um, and, you know, the University of British Columbia is just off to the left of your screen there it's at the end of a peninsula and is about 20 minutes drive from downtown Vancouver. So everything's pretty accessible. We can move on. Um, on to the campus. So this is the campus at the end of that peninsula that I just described. Um, UBC is a center for global research and teaching, and it's consistently ranked in the top 20 public universities in the world. Um, you know, having spent time in numerous universities, um, I guess I would say it really does have some cutting edge facilities, beautifully stimulating architecture, um, surrounded by natural forests and a, and a stunning coastline. Uh, views of the surrounding islands, um, really, uh, really nice place to be. Um, now the sun isn't always out and I'm sure that you're skeptical, uh, but especially this time of year, it can be rainy, but uh, it is certainly a gorgeous place despite uh, the rain. Um, and they've maintained, you know, beautiful green spaces on campus. And if you're interested in international forestry, this is the place to be. So let's move on to the next slide. So the campus houses every year 55, close to 56,000 
uh, students, a combination of graduate and undergraduate students. Um, but really, what the more interesting part about UBC is it's surrounded by a living laboratory of forest, uh, forested landscapes. Um, the interactions that take place between people and nature, uh, what we call learning landscapes, something that you would become very familiar with if you were uh, to join our program. So there's a bit of power of place for the University of British Columbia in that it's, you know, sort of a part uh, of the world where the the initial generation, the genesis of the science and practice of integrated ecosystem management-based approaches emerged. Um, and part of that was out of a deep understanding of the living connections between organisms, marine life and the forest life, uh, deep, deep in the indigenous knowledge systems that, that uh, pre-existed uh, colonial uh, settlers. Um, and a, a lot of that knowledge has influenced the, uh, the, the global uh, trajectory for how we consider uh, integrated forestry management systems. So we can move move on. Um, this is a picture of the Forest Science Center building. Um, the UBC forestry faculty is consistently ranked in the top three forestry schools in the world. Uh, it houses over 1,500 students, of which 300 are graduate students annually. Uh, it's a pretty well-supported faculty because we do a a good job, I think, at fulfilling UBC's commitment to attract and support people who have the drive to shape a better world, and forests being a major central part of that brighter future. Um, I guess I can comment on the incredibly high diversity in the student body and in the faculty, um, something that we're proud of and we think makes us uh, uh, a desirable place to study. Um, we're also renowned for our committed faculty, uh, and it's a supportive faculty. They support each other. In the pivot to COVID earlier in this year, it was, it was a humbling experience to be part of a, a, a faculty that worked well with each other in such challenging times. Um, so let's move on to the next slide. Um, really, forestry, uh, UBC forestry has redefined what forestry means. Uh, it's more than you think. It's, it's not. Um, it's not bearded men in, in, in the flannel shirts like I'm wearing, carrying um, lumberjacks, uh, axes uh, only. It's a lot more things than that. Um, I guess I would say that the building that we are housed in is inspiring. It's a place people like to spend time. It's a place students like to study in. The building showcases construction using Canadian wood products. Um, you can see sort of a treehouse looking place there. Um, it's got a lot of natural light. It's a pleasant place to be. And our program is, is uh, privileged to have a very nice uh, room right across. If you see that picture on the left there, there's a bridge right across that bridge with some glass walls that open up into the atrium for nice views. So let's, uh, let's move on. All right. So other than the International Forestry Program, there are three others. Uh, professional development graduate programs. Uh, we are the international forestry master. There's a geomatics master, which mainly deals with GIS and remote sensing. There's a, a new uh, on board this year, an urban forestry leadership master, and, an, and the uh, MSFM, Master of Sustainable Forestry Management master, which is a, a, a fast track route to getting a registered professional forestry license. But uh, from now on, we'll call the Master of International Forestry the MIF program for short, and um, we're, that's what we're going to spend our time talking about to you today. That's where we're, what we are all part of. All right, let's move on to what we are about. So, names are tricky. They conjure up different images, ideas. International forestry. Um, MIF could also be known as Master of Development Practice in Forest Landscape, Master of Sustainability Science as it relates to forests. Essentially, we consider forestry uh, at the international level and its connection to local realities and its, ish and its relationship to issues of global sustainability um, um, topics. So when you read this sort of mission statement about the MIF, uh, what does it sound like? You've got social, environmental, and economic challenges. Those are the pillars of sustainability. So we look at 
forestry through sustainability science. Um, but we also, you see the words required to address. Um, and I guess we, among others, uh, in the international education arena, asserts that certain ways of learning are more conducive to solving these complex challenges than others. Um, and we think that we've developed a curriculum and pedagogy that fits that niche pretty well. Um, it's pretty much demand-side driven education. This fits, you know, 15 years ago, the United Nations Commission on Education for Sustainable Development called for uh, investment into education that met the grand challenges, uh, which then turned into Agenda 2030, which m many of you might know or might not know, but these are the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And that's where we fit our niche as a, uh, as a m professional master program. So we are less on the technical side of giving you skill sets that might fit one narrowly defined job set, but we are more on the providing critical and uh, critical thinking and, and, and technical sort of social skills for solving the wicked problems and, and addressing the strategies for solving those wicked problems. So we can move on. Now, as a professional development program, we we try to fit everything into about a year. So this is about 10 months long. You start in September, uh, at which point you go into some heavy coursework. And at the end of the first and second semester, you have an opportunity um, and are required to uh, complete a, at least two months, can be up to as many months as you like, or years, uh, placements, directed studies, or projects. Now these are broadly defined, so these can take the shape of uh, uh, you know, typical internships or um, you can saddle up with uh, researchers and, and put yourself in a lab if you're interested in higher education and we are well connected with all these different avenues for um, furthering your career. So let's move on. So this section, I guess, is what we're really about, the, the meat of uh, what you're going to learn. So we can move on to say that our curriculum is really a, uh, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a mix of hands-on and, and theoretical knowledge. So we, we're not applying theory to, to challenges. We're taking a grounded approach to understanding the issues uh, that exist and, uh, and imp improvising the right sorts of theories that are necessary to apply to them. It's very action-oriented research and practice and professional development and we don't you know disaggregate um, this is a very integrated way of looking at learning and practice so we can that's actually a picture of uh, uh, of us on Tofino Island uh, in Tofino on Vancouver Island the epicenter for the infamous war in the woods where, where the battle the global battles for uh, between conservation and development were unfolding um, and uh, a place that we can learn from uh, at the international level and from various other landscapes around us on um, how to approach and solve some of the wicked problems that we're facing today. Uh, so yes, we can move on to some of the more topical things. In the MIF, you will take classes in uh, things that cover a wide range of pro uh, topics. Uh, these are all cross-cutting issues. The courses themselves can be cross-cutting. So we examine the relationships and the diverse and plural relationships between forest society. Um, there's a, sort of a, a high degree of complementarity between the courses that you take. So we examine the, um, you know, the rise of, um, uh, of the handover of lands internationally to local and indigenous peoples and, and how to, how to um, you know, manage that process. Um, we examine the best practices for integrated natural resource management and provides you opportunities to get skills in, in you know, data, you know, spatial data set analysis or um, whatever the, the latest is in integrating uh, natural resource management. So a lot of this is uh, learning by doing. So while you learn some theories, we provide a lot of leadership and management um, sort of opportunities for you. A lot of it isn't necessarily rote learning. Uh, we, it's, as I said, learning by doing. Uh, it's, 
in order for you to have the opportunity to improve, to improve your skills for climbing the ladder and, and, and having the competency and, and comfortableness of standing up in front of audiences to talk about the global issues. I guess one comment is that uh, international forestry, it's not the same year to year. It's always changing. So our curriculum is always changing with it. It's, it's you know, we, some of our professors will say uh, they never give the same PowerPoint presentation or lecture twice because it's, uh, you know, every year is a new year and the issues change along with it. This year, you know, who, who would have known this year we would have been facing the situation we're in last year? Um, so uh, let's move on to the next uh, slide. So this continues. Uh, in the second semester, you dive a bit deeper into some uh, sort of mode, um, block mode style courses where you take um, one course at a time. One of them is based on economics and finance. Another one is based on business enterprise. Another one is based on international forest governance and policy. And another one is based on the institutions which determine these um, in governance and policy outcomes and, and how to conduct yourself in international diplomacy and negotiation settings. So to sum up, what you learn in the MIF is less of the what and more of the how. How, how you're going to um, increase your um, capacity to engage in international diplomatic and negotiation settings. Uh, and that requires your learning experience to be both experiential, um, learning by doing. It's very problem-based, so issue-based with, you know, solution-focused, uh, and it's transdisciplinary. Um, and we are not um, we're providing a set of disciplines that you study and then take on to a, uh, a job setting. This is very much uh, working um, in an interdisciplinary way engaging with society to solve the grand challenges. So all that to say, we are a group, a tight knit group of, of uh, I guess, collaborators, uh, a fantastic cast of, of characters here on the screen that uh, I hold in quite high esteem and so does the international forestry community. Uh, these are high profile, influential um, people uh, in, that have had uh, influential positions in global conservation and development institutions, forestry institutions, research institutions, um, you know, NGOs, uh, uh, societal organizations. Um, so on the screen, you see a, a wide range of backgrounds. Um, uh, and these are, you know, under each name, you see some of the history of the international organizations with whom they've worked and continue to work. And you can see the scope uh, there from United Nations uh, organizations, the FAO. Um, and these are the places where a lot of the decisions and narratives over what forestry directions are headed are taken. So I'd just like to note here on the screen that you can see um, you know, food is popping up, you know, the Food and Agriculture Organization. You know, conservation is popping up, you know, International Union for the Conservation of Nature. Uh, development is, prop, is, is um, popping up in the CG system. Um, uh, you have uh, people that have concerned themselves with the, the, the main thinking in the production, the conservation, and how that affects livelihoods, both local and globally. Uh, for indigenous populations and, um, and, and the global public goods values of forests. Um, so we really occupy the full spectrum here of, uh, of forestry and society. So I think now is the right moment to introduce some people that are on the call uh, with us. Um, I guess first uh, I would like to introduce Professor Hosni El Khani, followed by Professor Terry Sunderland, then followed by Professor Jeff Sayer, and finally by Professor Intuburi Hartono. I'd like them to introduce themselves and contribute to some thoughts on our to our global audience on um, on the MIF about you know a personal introduction and their relationship to the international forestry program. So uh, Hosni, if you'd like to jump in and uh, say a few words for us. Uh, 
Okay, good morning or good afternoon, everybody. Can you see me or you hear me? Is okay? You hear me, yeah? Do you hear me? We hear Yes, you. we can hear you. Sorry. Well, uh, my name is Hasni Lakani. I uh, very briefly, I got my first degree in agriculture at the Alexander University in Egypt. And then I came to Canada to study forestry. And uh, after that, I worked in academia in tree genetics and uh, uh, breeding. Then I joined the FAO. I went from tree genetics or forest genetics to international forestry, ended up in FAO as the head of the forestry department. And then I came back to UBC as adjunct professor and I do some uh, consultancies for international organizations. The course I teach is the, uh, I think the last one in the first group, which is uh, the eighth course. And this is related to international forestry in terms of uh, issues and institutions and diplomacy. And uh, by the time uh, students arrive to this course, they are very well informed about uh, what's happening in forestry internationally. What I would do is to, to put this in an international perspective, like looking at the state of the world forest, what's happening in the world forest, and this is changing almost on a yearly basis, as James mentioned. And then we look at where do forestry fit into these international organizations uh, or uh, international agreements, conventions, and so on. Some of you know that uh, about the conventions on climate change, biodiversity, uh, desertification, the agreements on uh, uh, Paris Agreement on climate change, uh, sustainable development goals, and all of this. We put the, we look at the role of forestry and the role envisaged for forestry into these uh, agreements and how is this changing with time. And finally, we talk about how to handle uh, yourself as a professional uh, in uh, negotiating uh, these, uh, some agreements. It could be as a government representative, as a private sector, as a person working for a consulting firm, and how to bring all this information that your government agreed on in international agreements into translated into national forest plan. This is uh, briefly what I try to do in, the, uh, in this course. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Hosni. Uh, that was great. Uh, Hosni's course is the, uh, the final course that you would take at the MIF, and it ties everything together very nicely. Um, uh, so I guess we'll, we'll, we'll jump to Professor Terry Sunderland. Uh, he's on the line, Terry. Hi, thanks, James. Um, I'm, I'm assuming everybody can hear me. My, my mic seems to be working. Um, it's very um, great pleasure to be here. Um, I'm, my name is Terry Sunderland, as you can see. Um, there's a whole bunch of acronyms on that page, which are fairly daunting, I'm sure, to most of you, but they'll become clear at some point. Um, I have a first degree in horticulture and botany and a master's in forestry and a PhD in anthropology and biology. So I kind of um, a, a bit of jack of all trades, master of none, uh, some, sometimes have been described as, um, and come up, come at uh, sort of forestry from a more socio-ecological perspective um, and try and be as embracing of, of transdisciplinarity as possible. And I hope that's reflected in the course that I teach on the MF, which is natural resource management. I've only been at um, UBC about, um, almost coming up for three years now. And um, previously to that, I was working with the Center for International Forestry Research in Indonesia for 12 years or so. And previous to that, I was in West Africa, based in Cameroon for uh, almost 15 years, working for a whole bunch of uh, different institutions, including the British government, the Smithsonian Institution. So I have a, a, a strong background in, in real life conservation and development practice, um, as well as a, a, a strong focus on research as well. Um, and again, I hope that's reflected in, in the course, uh, which is taught in the first semester. And we really try and, and bring together uh, lots of different disciplines in understanding how forests are managed uh, in, in broader landscape, in a broader landscape perspective, the socio-ecological implications of different management decisions, how trade-offs and synergies are exploited and understood, and how to manage at the landscape scale when you have so many different stakeholders with many, many different interests. So that's really the emphasis of, of that course, natural resource planning. Um, 
And we also focus on the interconnections between forestry, landscape management, and food systems. We talk a lot about agriculture and, and the way it leads to, to long-term deforestation and permanent conversion of forest land. And start, think about and question whether our current food systems are actually doing us well, both environmentally and also nutritionally, and, and talk about issues of dietary diversity and the role that forests and trees and agroforests play um, in the global food systems as well. So it, it's all around um, uh, sort of bit of a potpourri of different things uh, on the course um, but it really I think hope hopefully also um, positions the students who have taken the course to understand the broader perspectives of forestry which are brought together in the wider MIF uh, course structure as well so thank you very much for, for giving me time to introduce myself and I look forward to the rest of the presentation Thank you very much, Terry. And uh, I invite Terry and Hosni if you have anything to say in the next couple of slides uh, or, or in, in the question and answer session, especially to jump in and uh, when it makes sense. So, um, and I do promise that by the end of a, an experience in MIF, you would have mastered the alphabet soup on the screen here. Um, but uh, let's move on. Uh, Professor Jeff Sayer, if you have an introduction. Hello everybody, good morning, good evening. I'm Jeff Sayer. I'm a biologist, ecologist originally. I have always throughout my career been committed to conserving forests, pretty much always um, tropical forests. And I've worked for a very long time in the field in Africa and Asia. And I still like to spend as much time as possible in the field. I still go back to the places that I've been working in for all those years. But I've also worked for a number of different international organizations in, in fairly senior positions. So I initiated and ran the forest conservation program at the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. And I established and ran for the first 10 years the Center for International Forestry Research in Indonesia. And I've been heavily involved in several of the international conservation organizations that are concerned with forests. And I maintain those links. I maintain a lot of involvement with different people who are working at a practical level to conserve forests. So I think that what I bring to you as potential students is the is a very rich network of people who are active in the field and who are working in organizations for which you might yourselves seek employment in, in the future. So our work continues to be focused on Southeast Asia and Central Africa, but we're now of course doing much more work in in British Columbia, especially recently since we couldn't travel. Um, I've only been here for three years, like Terry Sunderland. Um, we have had a very interesting group of students from all sorts of different backgrounds. The diversity of the, of the students has been one of the, the enriching features of this course. So what we hope that we will achieve with our students is to connect them up to this global network of people who are active in sustainable forest management, forest conservation, and forest policy issues. So I look forward in the future to at least meeting some of you here in British Columbia. Thank you. Great, thank you, Jeff. Uh, I guess um, I haven't really introduced my background, but uh, you have heard me speaking for a while now, but I, uh, I am sort of a product of the people that have spoken so far. I'm a product of uh, Jeff and, and Intu and uh, and Terry, I have uh, I did my PhD in Indonesia on the political ecology of of uh, large development initiatives of affecting forest landscapes and what it meant for local people in their envir environments. Um, so I'll just hand it over to Professor Intu, the director of the MIF program, who will uh, introduce herself and talk about some of the things we do in the field. Thank you, James. So uh, good morning, good afternoon, uh, everyone, uh, wherever you are. I'm so happy to be here. So my background is actually in fine arts and anthropology. And it is quite an interesting thing probably if everybody wonder why am I in faculty of forestry? So our interest is actually very multidisciplinary and very uh, much into interdisciplinary approach. So I think uh, I, I would like to see a lot of students coming from a lot of different disciplines because we can learn a lot more and a lot more views can be exchanged when we are um, studying together and learning and sharing together. 
So um, I've been working with uh, International Union for Conservation of Nature. I work a lot with different uh, UN organizations uh, because they see the importance of this multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary approach when we are looking at uh, forest landscapes because um, there are a lot of different cultural part of things, there are a lot of economic part of things, and there's also a lot of environmental issues in these landscapes. So uh, I hope that um, uh, we can give you a little bit of um, interesting sites about this program. And um, the, the, the idea is that we would like to have people uh, going to the field and working a lot with partners and uh, build long-term relationship with the different organizations that we have been working with. As you see in the list here, a lot of people are working with so many different organizations, including um, civil society organizations, local government, universities, and even private sector, because private sector is also one of the most important stakeholder in the landscapes. I think our main uh, interest is what's happening in the world and the global issues and also the, all this sustainability, how do we um, handle all these different um, and how do we approach all these different uh, problems um, in the world. So I do hope that um, we can get um, more people from as many different uh, disciplines and as many different countries as possible in the program because I do think people can learn and share a lot from each other. And um, yeah, I guess that's a it for from me and maybe uh, I will talk more about the field work components afterwards. Great, thank you very much, Jintu. Uh, ben, you can move us along, and yeah. I will just briefly go through the next couple of slides. Uh, this is uh, describes the cohort schedule. So the MIF runs at a cohort. You are a tight knit group of students that uh, uh, spend time only with each other and uh, the occasional guests uh, from other faculties join you uh, here and there. But in the first semester, you would be exposed to four, um, well, three, three courses as it would run normally over a semester long um, um, course load. Uh, and then for the spring semester, you, you experience these block mode courses, which are essentially are month long individual courses where you dive in depth every day uh, for, for, um, for, for three weeks um, um, at a time uh, into one subject. So you can see those subjects laid out for you there. Uh, but along the side there, you can see a, a, it's called module five, where you see topics in international forestry, which is a, a, a year-long top uh, um, course where we expose you to lots and lots of guests, guests that are very influential and innovative in the international forestry scene. Um, so that is one big plus of the program. Um, so we can move on from this cohort schedule slide to uh, what we think that you will come out of the program equipped to do. And um, these are as into uh, and uh, Terry and Jeff and Hosni have said, um, you know, broad reaching and uh, we expect generalists to come out of the program uh, well versed in the international forestry discourses. Um, and it should be a springboard for people that aren't already in the international forestry stream to get into the international forestry scene. Or if you're already in the scene to move move laterally into a place of, uh, you know, where you might desire or vertically up the decision uh, making hierarchy. Um, so we can move on. So uh, I think um, Intu will jump in here and start to sort of describe a few ways in which we learn, which is very hands on and in the field, um, in addition to uh, in the classroom. Take it away, Intu. Yeah, thanks, James. So um, I usually uh, sort of open the class with Jeff Sayer and, and uh, James as well. And then there's another person who's also there, usually Rebecca Riggs. So we're usually having the first class, um, uh, Forest and Society. It's sort of uh, a course that we thought could be a, sort of like an opening or linking up all the different classes that um, will be running in the MIF and we take students to the field because we 
being in British Columbia, being in Vancouver, we're so close to forested landscapes and we are in the coastline and there's a lot of different um, problematic or global issues that could happen also in other parts of the world. So we usually bring our students to uh, the interior of British Columbia or to Vancouver Island. Um, and can we see the next slide, Ben? So yeah, we basically we're, we're trying to have the classes in the classroom, but also the part of the field work is a, an important part because that's when we meet with our partners and our collaborators on the ground. So this is when we were going to Squamish, which is just about an hour away from Vancouver, north of Vancouver, where there are a lot of different, um, um, you could say, logging industries, but you also have First Nations or indigenous groups living in the area, and you have a lot of different stakeholders who has a lot of different interests in the landscape. So we meet with uh, all these different stakeholders and we try to understand what are the different important issues in that landscapes. Uh, next, please. So we also try to understand what are the different kind of possibilities, uh, economic possibilities in the area, because um, there's a lot of different um, activities in the landscapes. And of course, uh, the economic part of things is a very important part of things. And whether if a small, medium forest enterprise could give um, an added value to some of all these logs, as you see here in the photo, it, it was a, a meeting with um, uh, a community forest. Um, I don't see the last slide anymore. <laughs> yes. Okay, so it, this is a, a small community forest that is actually organized by uh, Jeff, uh, I forgot his name, but uh, so we, we, he took us to see this uh, place where some of the First Nation elders is also doing some sculpture and, and it could add value to the big logs uh, or cedar trees that are actually they're selling to the uh, usually they're selling to the companies but here the first nation elder is actually making it into uh, totem poles or a sculpture which can add value to their economy next please this is art uh, who is a local artist it's a first nation elder from the squamish nation so he's explaining to the students why is it important uh, to have an added value to all the different kind of um, raw materials in the region? And some of the students who are international students, they get to learn also the cultural part um, of the thing in the area. And I think it is important because we need to be able to understand the relationship between the social value, economic value, and the natural value of the landscapes. Next, please. We also visited some of the area where the logging companies and the community forest activities, which is a really um, interesting place to, to be able to visit because for students who are coming from other parts of the world or uh, the tropical countries, for example, it is quite a different way of um, uh, looking at logging activities. And um, I guess, uh, I don't know if Jeff want to add anything. Uh, there's Terry and Jeff who was also there. So we tried to bring several other professors with us so we can get different views about the condition in a landscape. And so we're not just learning in a classroom, but also at the same time, we can discuss things with the different um, people who are actually in the landscapes. So these areas are very interesting because they are places where um, struggles are going on that are going on throughout the world of, of forests. Struggles between industry large industry and between environmentalists and, and smaller local industries. So we're really interested in how the benefits of forests flow to different people in these landscapes. We're especially interested in First Nations and indigenous peoples uh, use of forests and benefits from forests. And we spend a lot of time talking about how one can reconcile the conflicts between economic, industrial demands upon forests and environmental demands upon forests. Clearly, forests are incredibly important parts of the global environment in the context of biodiversity and climate change. And sometimes there is a conflict between those values of forests and the direct economic values, the instrumental values from exploiting the forest. So a lot of our work is focused on how people can in different places and different situations 
resolve those sorts of conflicts. So we're interested in the place-based uh, uh, research as well. So that's why I think some of these areas that we go to could be really good areas to learn about all these different issues. So it, because this kind of thing could happen in other parts of the world, including in Indonesia or in Brazil or in, in Cameroon or the Congo Basin, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So next, please. So one of the other thing is that at the end of the program is the placement or internship, or we could say also directed studies. So some of the students goes overseas. This one is a uh, student goes to Indonesia, where we have a working collaboration with conservation organization. So some of the students are interested in uh, doing survey of birds, for example, or wildlife um, camera traps and things like that. So uh, they get to the chance to be able to learn about the real life condition and the real uh, problem that uh, conservation organization or companies that has to face in the landscape. So it's important to be aware of the fact that the cohort of students includes people from many different countries. I think we probably had about 20 different countries represented in recent years from South America, Africa, Asia, and of course, North America. Mm -hmm. So this is really an important part of the of the experience you would have if you came here to be in a group, a very diverse group of people. And probably more than half of them do not have forestry as a first degree. The other important thing is that when people go off to do these directed studies and internships, we encourage them strongly to go to places all over the world. We want to maximize the diversity of experiences that they achieve. So people have gone to work for the United Nations in Geneva, uh, to all sorts of places in Africa and Asia. And this, we think, is a, a unique selling point of this program, that it really does bring together interests and people from all over the world. Next, please. So one of the of the side that is very interesting is in Riau in Sumatra, where we actually collaborate with a big company, one of the biggest pulp and paper company who has a restoration concession. So uh, some of the students has been going there the last two years, and they can do a lot of uh, activities with the companies looking at the different uh, using camera traps and what are the different biodiversity in the area. And also, how do you manage um, um, the sustainability of the area? And also, because there's a lot of people living in those areas, so they try to understand the different wicked problem that is in that uh, concession or restoration area. So this company is conserving um, almost half a million hectares of natural forest within the concessions where its plantations occur. And in those natural forests, it's now established a, a lodge, an eco lodge, a research lodge, where students from UBC, but also from other institutions, can go to do research and to get involved in practical conservation work. Next, please. We're probably running out of time soon. So, yeah, this is uh, some of the activities that we do as well with uh, all these different companies. So, also, we work a lot with conservation organizations. So, we try to uh, link them actually between those different stakeholders so that they can understand better what are the different importance and the different visions and priorities in those landscapes. Next, please. So this is James doing uh, the mangrove survey. So, so you might be able to come along with uh, some of us because we ourselves, we do our research in some of these areas. So we usually do bring students with us, uh, and it could be part of the uh, placement or directed studies. Next, please. I think one of the of the interesting thing is also to be able to go to these uh, amazing places, either in Indonesia or Cameroon or uh, South America, with a team and working in a team. I think it's, it's not the same thing if you're working on your own, but looking at it in, in a sort of a multidisciplinary, transdisciplinary way with the local colleagues and the local communities there. Next, please. One of the other things that we do afterwards is we also uh, organize seminars and international conferences and things like that. So that's part of the learning by doing and the knowledge sharing of the program. So we also do a lot of work with all these different stakeholders trying to transfer all the different 
knowledge that we get by learning together in these landscapes. Next, please. Yeah, I guess I'll give this back to James because I think uh, we're going to be running out of time and so that we'll let you have a few questions afterwards. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. The uh, question is, is the MIF program right for you? So we've showed you pictures of uh, muddy boots on the ground, or sometimes no boots, muddy feet in the in the peat swamps, and also sitting in in uh, you know with suits and ties in in boardrooms. So we're about uh, linking those different parts of society. So if you're interested in the broader agenda of linking up different parts of society as they relate to forests, the program is right for you. We do not. Um, Say if you ha if you don't have a forestry background, as Jeff said earlier, that you're uh, disqualified. We welcome people from various parts of society as long as you're interested and inspired to solving those grand challenges and closing those gaps. We can um, then that can be in any sector of society, whether it be government, NGOs, financial, private sector, etc. Uh, we can move on. So. I guess also going back to is this program right for you? Uh, we, you know, this year we have a, a diversity of students that includes healthcare practitioners, uh, engineers, uh, computer scientists. Uh, so you think, wow, that's that's pretty broad. Uh, but essentially, the convergence point is: Are you interested in in reconciling these grand challenges? And uh, and if so, then the program is right for you. Um, we can move on. On to career opportunities. Wow. Okay. If the career, if the program is this broad, how does this, uh, how does this lead you to a career? Um, on to the next slide. So, the big things going on in the world: the international commitments to sustainability. You've got the United Nations SDGs. Uh, you've got the decade of ecosystem restoration. These things mean allocated funding of millions and, and billions of dollars into initiatives that require professionals to help solve these challenges. So there are, you know, proliferating career opportunities for you and huge gaps to fill. Um, we do not sit in a um, in a in one domain where we um, uh, are really dependent on one sector of forestry to survive. Uh, we are uh, we are sort of training people to be adaptive in a career of tra changing and dynamic forestry institutions. This is a quote I got yesterday from a um, from a report titled "The Innovative Finance for Conservation: Roles for Ecologists and Practitioners." And more than nine trillion dollars just in the USA of managed assets in sustainable investment funds. I mean, that's a huge amount of money, and that was five years ago. Um, you know, conservation finance is 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 on the rise, and uh, COVID may have affected things in the short term, but that uh, you know the the opportunities for zoonotic disease research are certainly increasing. Um, we can move on. Essentially, we think forests are central to the issues of sustainability and sustainable development, and therefore train you as, as such, which mean the career opportunities are as broad as, uh, as you can imagine them to be. Um, but for some realities, um, you know, the forestry sector, there are groundbreaking forestry technologies and indexes and data sets. And I think also just yesterday, I read that WDS, the Wildlife Conservation Society, launched their uh, Forest Integrity Index. Um, now, what does that mean for practitioners on the ground? And that's what we're interested in doing, uh, providing the skills to, to, to interpret these sorts of data sets to make the better decisions with them, because uh, a decision support tool only exists if, uh, if you have decision makers to, to use that support tool. Um, all right, moving on. And as evidence for some of this, uh, what some of our alumni have been saying about the program, um, go ahead. That's a picture of our cohort pre-COVID, so we, we didn't have to wear masks and we didn't have to stand two meters apart. Um, we can move on. Uh, the, you know, 100% of the students go on and into a placement uh, and, uh, and and most of them ended up in in the field of their interest. Um, so here we here we go. This is from the class of 2016. Uh, Jasmine, who interned at Taking Root and uh, the World Agroforestry Center, ICRAF, which is based in Kenya. Um, um, we can move on. 
Uh, this is Daniel Ortiz, also class of 2016, who entered at the FAO of the United Nations. Um, you know, people have thought that the program certainly has uh, focused their uh, attention to the to, to sort of the generalist uh, um, ways of thinking about issues and um, enhancing their critical thinking skills to survive in the uh, changing forestry institutions of the world. We can move on. Um, uh, the most recent, um, uh, we can move on, Ben. Uh, most recent quote, I think we've frozen. Have we frozen? Ben, can we move on? Uh, we've lost the uh, technical difficulties. We'll be back in a moment. Essentially, we've had lots of students that uh, uh, when they leave the program, might not have a, a full grasp on what they've gotten out of the program until a year or two later when uh, things have all of a sudden clicked into gear. Um, if we move on to the next slide. This is a, a recent graduate from 2020. Uh, and uh, this seems like a, a long time ago in the, the year of COVID. Um, I got this email from Jennifer two days ago. I didn't ask for it. She sent it to me. Um, saying it's how cool it's been transitioning to work into the same field that uh, she studied for her undergraduate degree and how it's given her the opportunity to find out where she really fits in the forestry industry. Um, this is a, a student of uh, Chinese heritage who went back to Beijing and worked for APFNet for an internship that lasted six months, so four months beyond the two mandatory months, uh, where she discovered her passion for community-based forestry. She had no passion for community-based forestry uh, before she enrolled, so it's really an, uh, a nice story to hear. And now she's still working with APFNet and has secured a job with them. And APFNet, for those of you that don't know them, it's the Asia Pacific Forestry Network, uh, one of the uh, sort of billowing, gr exponentially growing um, forestry institutions in the world. Okay, Ben? All right, so this is where my moment is to hand things over to uh, Julie Mori, who will give you some details on how to um, how to apply for the program and the requirements. Julie? Excellent. Thank you, James. And welcome to everyone, and I'm so happy that you're with us. And my name, again, is Julie Mori, and I'm the admissions coordinator for the MAF program. And in this section of the presentation, um, I'll be covering admission program requirements, steps, and also helpful hints to remember during the application process. And I am very mindful of the time, so I'll address specifics because many of you have sent in pre-questions which are in the admissions realm. So a bulk of these will be answered in the next section, and if not, I will cover during the Q&A time at the end of the presentation. But And don't hesitate to remind me if I have not answered your question. Um, so viewing this slide of the program requirements, um, you'll read there that applicants must have an academic background in science, social science, um, et cetera. I do want to point out, and this is also continuing on the theme of James comment, that you don't have to have a forestry background. Um, and in reviewing the following slides that we'll go through, you can still apply even if you don't meet minimum academic requirements. Um, this does not preclude you from being accepted into the program. And the committee recognizes that you have other strengths and experience within your application. And so specific questions related to both your professional and academic background can be addressed by James and into during the Q&A section. So minimum academic requirements. In Canada and the US, that means a four-year bachelor degree in the B-plus range, which is 76 at UBC, in senior level courses. And for international students, this of course varies quite broadly by country. And Grad Studies has a great website that shows you what the minimum requirements are. Um, I do want to say a few notation on GPAs, that we do not convert your grades to the UBC scale. We use your grading key. So if your GPA um, at your institution is in the B-plus range, then you meet general academic requirements. And um, some of you have previously asked, so what happens if I have a low GPA? So for Canadian and US students, there's something called the 12 credit rule, which we can then calculate based on 12 credits of your senior level 
within the A range in the field of study. And then you would still meet minimum general admission requirements. So there are caveats to that. And you can always email me for in-depth um, answers to those questions or on the website. And at the end of the presentation, I'll give you the three main links for finding all of this information. And um, again, on minimum, minimum academic requirements, applicants from a university outside of Canada and the US in which English is not the primary language of instruction must provide results. Um, it's important to note that the Department of Forestry actually has a higher English language proficiency requirement than UBC grad studies. So as an example, um, IELTS for forestry is a band score of seven. Whereas if you went on the grad studies website for graduate studies, it's a six. And for TOEFL, forestry is requirement is 100, whereas grad studies will list 90. So we ask that you do visit the MIF admission requirements website for detailed information regarding that. So how to apply? Um, I'll go through each of the five points and I'll highlight important information. And these are based on some of the preliminary questions that you submitted prior to this presentation. So number one, uh, complete the online application and pay the application fee. So you'll see there Canadian is $108 and these are all in Canadian funds and international is $168. And note that the application fee is non-refundable and there's the fee is only waived in one circumstance, and that's if you're a citizen of one of the world's 50 least developed countries, as declared by the United Nations. And there's a link to the full list of countries um, on the Grad Studies website. And number two, providing copies of official transcripts for all post-secondary institutions that you've, in, that you've attended. And very important, this includes, even though you might not think it's important, your exchange programs. And if you took a course, even if it's one course at an institution, even if no conferral took place, it's important that uh, you supply all post-secondary transcripts within your application. And another point to this is please scan the back of your transcript, which has the grading key, because we will actually hound you and track you down and get you to upload that if you didn't initially. And regarding your references, three references, at least one has to be an academic reference. And some of you have asked the question that, you know, you're a professional, you've been out of school for a long time, and you might have difficulty finding an academic reference. And it's still a requirement. And so we highly recommend that, um, that you can use um, you can use someone who has taught you um, has been part of a, a course you've taken or continuing studies or even a professional management course you can always use them for for professional references and number four sending in your official english language proficiency results we've already covered some of that and while our most common are IELTS and TOEFL, Grad Studies does accept other testing institutions. So please go to the website and you'll find a full list there. And number five, submit your MIF letter of intent, questionnaire, and CV. And this is pretty self-explanatory and there's no hard and fast rules or regulations on this, but just remember that this is the section of your application you can really you know, particularly shine as your personality experiences and interests will come out. So put your best foot forward when completing this section and take your time when you do that. So the next slide on, uh, on applying, there's our links to how to apply and then also keeping in mind the deadline, which is March 15th for this upcoming September 2021 intake. And uh, now we'll move on to tuition and funding. And uh, tuition is um, 19,000 for Canadian per year and international is over um, 34,000. And um, this is involved uh, or it paid in three different installments. 
in the September, January, and May. And part of your, once you accept or offered a position and accept it, you are required to pay a $1,000 non-refundable acceptance deposit. And this is refunded back to you within the first semester of uh, your tuition fees. So that does come back to you. And many people have asked, why is tuition so high for international students? And as UBC is a publicly funded university, like approximately 45% comes from government funds uh, of which Canadians pay taxes. So that is one of the reasons why international fees are higher than uh, Canadian fees. And many of you have asked about tuition and funding and particularly scholarship opportunities. So um, because it's a professional master's program, merit-based award opportunities are very limited. Um, but we, what we do have is clearly outlined on our website, and that includes links to the UBC bursary, uh, which is needs-based funding. So I encourage you all to, to look there. And we're also very happy that we are participate in the MasterCard Foundation Scholars Program, and also now the Joint World Bank scholarship program as well and our full details are also found on our website so just uh, please visit those sites and in the Q&A section if there's anything that I've missed then we'll gladly answer those questions and I do want to say um, in closing that we are here to assist you with every single step of the application process and if for any reason you're uncomfortable in asking a question in the chat box, you can always contact me through our uh, email address, which I'll put in the chat box as well. And I can answer any of your questions via email, or we can set up a phone or Zoom time. So I'm always happy to help. Thanks. Thanks, Julie. All right, we're going to move on to the Q&A session. So this is a chance if you have questions that haven't been forwarded to us or would like to converse with us, uh, now is your opportunity. Please use the chat box um, on the uh, on the right hand side of your screen if you have any questions. Um, I believe we answered a lot of the preemptive questions throughout of our, our, our presentation. Uh, are there any that are uh, would anybody would like to ask now? I see one question in the chat. It's more of a, um, a, a plea for help about finding a supervisor. Um, so supervisors, I uh, think Julie, uh, somebody that would be more suited for that would be somebody like Robin in the uh, graduate. Uh, exactly. So for the professional master's programs, we don't have supervisors. That's only for the research-based um, programs. So I will, you can send an email to the forestry.cbm email, and then I will get you in touch with the research-based program. I can add a little bit, maybe, uh, usually the students will have a supervisor when they're doing their directed studies. So that will be the, the last two months of the program, because each one of them uh, each one of the student will be working on a topic or with a partner or with a collaborator and there will be somebody from UBC. Uh, it would be one of us in the program who could be the supervisor for that directed studies or placement. All right, so we have a few questions popping up here. Um, Conservation, wildlife conservation, does that con come under conservation, forestry conservation? Well, I think um, Professor Jeff Sayer spent his career uh, in wildlife conservation. Uh, Jeff, would you like to chip in? Yep. Yes, we're really interested in that. We look at wildlife issues when we go on field trips. We encourage people to do their directed studies and their internships with organizations that are involved in wildlife conservation. And we stay in touch with the big international wildlife conservation organizations. So uh, it's very central to my own interests, and it it gets a good a good coverage in the in the MIF program. Okay. Next question I see here. Um, 
can the project at the end of the course be conducted anywhere a student has interest or are there specific options to choose from? So we have our networks that we're associated with that help people find, uh, find uh, you know, narrow their interests that might struggle, but we are certainly not limiting anybody to, to those uh, interests. Um, we encourage people to, um, to take that opportunity just to go places that they might not normally go or might not have the opportunity to go or might not have the correct net, the right network connections to get to. Um, and that's our comparative advantage is um, connecting people up. Yeah, and the student could also go uh, not only on their own. Uh, we sent two people to Sumatra, for example, last year, and and they were also people who who are uh, going to this um, directed studies or internship with others as well. So that's right. Um, the next question: How did COVID affect the program? So COVID affected us all quite personally, but it really didn't affect the program too much. Um, we, in March, we had to, we were coming back from a, uh, a, a week in the field while uh, the day that they shut um, British Columbia down and we had to move everything online uh, for the courses for that month. That being said, at the end of that month is when people started their directed studies and we were able to get everybody in a position where they could continue their directed studies. Now, that's because a lot of places that were operating in person had to move online too. Um, some people uh, that were going to go internationally uh, it could still go internationally, but through their you know computer devices because people were online at the time. Now, this year, uh, the way that the program has run during COVID has been in person. We had delivered in person classes. Um, and we are one of only four programs at the university that has managed the safety protocol to do so because we are a small program, normally of about 20 students and can fit uh, into large classrooms with physical separation between us and, and good technologies to support us. Um, I hope that answers that question. Um, so it has not inhibited any uh, placements or directed studies. Um, Okay, now the questions are propagating. Um, so another question, can you move on directly to a doctorate program? So this is not part of a streamline into a doctorate program, but certainly a lot of people have moved out of the MIF into doctorate programs. Um, now we, we consider research to be integral to professional development. So people come out with, oftentimes with skills that would be favorable to them doing more research, but uh, if that depends on the individual, it depends on their uh, who they would like to link up with. Um, yeah, I think I think there were several MIF students who continued to PhD, not necessarily at UBC, but also in other universities. And of course, if uh, while doing the MIF program you meet an uh, interesting professor with whom you would like to work with and things like that, that could be a good way to connect with the, um, yeah, whatever you want to do in your PhD program, I think. And I, I would just chip in by saying the Master of International Forestry program is, is sort of connected to the different laboratory labs and the research groups of the different professors. So we have a sort of international forestry research group that's comprised of the different professors that you saw on the screen and they'll have their research labs. So if you were, you know, um, inspired and passionate about anything that was going on, that those are certainly opportunities. Um, so I, I have one question here about uh, technical skills like GIS and data science and that um, in the working world, those, uh, those hard skills are certainly necessary. Um, so what we provide in the MIF is opportunities to pursue those skills that are interesting to you. We don't uh, unpack a, a pre-fixed set of skill sets for everybody, um, which means we're, we're sort of in a good position to uh, have workshops and, and sort of one-on-one -on -one training sessions for things like GIS. So we're, we're going to have some GIS workshops at the beginning of the new year for people that are interested in refining those skill sets. Uh, we certainly do some cost benefits, uh, economic hard data. 
analysis stuff in the beginning of the year. Um, and we certainly link people up with uh, in the faculty that are experts in these fields. Um, so you can think of uh, think of it as a hub where we can connect you to the people that are able to um, work with you on those. All right. Um, I've got a question whether UC has changed our thinking on forest issues. Does anybody want to comment on that question? <laughs> well, we really hope that it would. <laughs> Everything we do is, is trying to make people challenge their own preconceptions and really think very deeply about forest issues. So um, I guess that that's, that's what it's all about, really, getting you to, to do that. I think to complement what James was saying before about the sort of environment in which you work, we, we're part of a broader international forestry group. So there are lots of PhD students and masters by research students who work with us, with the different professors who work with the MIF. And you will get to know those. You will be having social contact with them and they'll be acting as teaching assistants and there will be opportunities to collaborate with them and to learn from them. So there are multiple opportunities for acquiring skills and contacts that are outside the MIF itself. UBC is a very rich and diverse place. There's lots and lots of things you can sign up to that are happening on the campus um, while you're here. And I guess uh, the MIF uh, is a professional master's program and it's quite short, it's 10 months, and it's also because we think that people who are mid-career who has worked before and things, they can't just leave their work for so long, right? And doing a two years program, it's just not possible for some people. So. That's why this is a very intensive program to be able to uh, everyone so they can get a grasp of the different uh, views and and uh, issues of uh, the global forest issues at the moment you know, internationally. And we hope that then people can then change behavior or, or take better decisions in the future when they got um, to their own um, work and things like that. So, yeah. I attended a, a workshop that said learning requires a disequilibrium of your thinking. And I guess if we're going to be part of the teaching and learning team, we were, we must be um, changing our thinking on things. So um, we, most of us moved here from the tropics, um, not all of us. Uh, and we have certainly changed some of our ways of thinking about forests since arriving at UBC. Um, is there, are there any other questions? Maybe I could just add in response to that last part of the discussion, the, the fact that we do have seminars every week and because people couldn't travel, we've been bringing people by Zoom for those seminars for the last semester. So we have leading people from international organizations working on forest issues all over the world. We've had people from South Africa, from Australia, from uh, Washington, from FAO in Rome, etc. And this is one of the really enriching things about this program, I think. And the other thing that hasn't come up yet at all is that UBC has amazing facilities, sporting facilities. We've got most incredible opportunities for a huge diversity of sports. There are multiple cultural activities going on. The city has amazing places for socializing. And we try to get students involved in those things. We try to have events off campus when people get together in restaurants and so forth in order to, to get to know each other and we bring in visitors to those events who are involved in forestry and international forestry who are living in or passing through vancouver yes we're interested in uh having relationships uh with a cohort of students that are not confined to the classroom um, so a vibrant cohort of people doing interesting things whether it's sporting or cultural other, otherwise are certainly interesting to us. Uh, Terry, would you like to say something? If I may, just to add the, the comment about um, changing perspectives on coming to BC. One thing that's, that sort of struck me by being here the last three years is how many or how similar some of the issues in BC forestry are to those that we've experienced in the tropics. Mm -hmm. Issues of livelihoods, issues of human wildlife conflict, issues of 
production in, in conservation landscapes, um, and all these things are sort of in a microcosm in, in, in DC. And it's it's really interesting to see how these things are, are traded off and, and dealt with at the management scale, um, with different perspectives and different stakeholders, depending on the, the, the landscape concerns. So that's been really fascinating from my perspective to learn how many similarities there are in forestry here in DC as there are in the tropics. Mm. Yeah. Yes, very true. Um, and we, we talk about integrated landscape approaches and you know, the, the lessons learned apply in both places. Um, I do see one uh, question here. Are there good placements after the completion? Uh, so far, everybody has, uh, has achieved, um, have secured a placement that they wanted to. Um, and that can be anywhere from private sector to uh, working with the government to uh, um, working with consulting agencies to um, working in research organizations. So um, the you know there's no limit really um, as long as it's you know, related to forestry issues broadly defined. Um, so thing that we try and do is to stay in touch with all the graduates of the program and as you imagine they're now all over the world so we have a really strong network of people who've come through this program and that's a resource that we exploit because they help us to find placements for the next set of graduates they also uh, alert us to the opportunities for employment and they just keep us abreast of issues in the places where they work and when we visit the countries that they're in we of course try to meet them and to uh, get them to help us to connect with things going on in those countries. So that's a very valuable resource that this program can, can draw upon. Yeah, and the alumni of the MIA program, regularly they come and visit also the new cohort and then they will then be able to uh, also share some of their experience and their, their work experience as well. So, which is very enriching too. So if there are no further questions, um, well, there's one popped up. The program is not that old. It's uh, how old is the program? I think it's um, Hosni would know the answer to that question. It's about five years, isn't it? Or oh, five or six years? Yeah, five six. years, maybe. Five, six well, years, I think. Start the start of uh, thinking and organizing this program started more than 10 years ago, but the actual mm -hmm. class was five. We are in the sixth course. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, if there aren't any further questions, uh, we can, uh, we're certainly documenting them and we have them, uh, if you'd like to approach us, you have the details uh, um, in the PowerPoint slides to approach us and on the website, you can certainly approach us. Uh, we'll welcome, we welcome any, uh, any questions. Um, and it's been a pleasure connecting with you all uh, this afternoon or wherever you are, whatever time of day it is or night. Um, so on that note, Ben. Um, yes. If you still have questions, there are some of the details. And uh, thank, thank you for thank being you there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I hope Thank you all you stay everyone. healthy and safe. Yeah. <coughs> thank you, okay. everyone. And uh, thank you. Thank you, Hazi and Terry, for joining us. And uh, we can, uh, you can follow us on social media. We have Instagram and uh, Twitter and Facebook accounts. Um, and please follow up with us.